Well, welcome to Online Church. It's fantastic to see you again, and thank you for allowing us right into your living room again this uh, day. And it's uh, our privilege to be online again and sharing from the Bible the truth that we want to to receive and and live by again today. We're starting a brand new series today, and I'm really very excited about uh, this series. It was it was thought up and developed way back in January, and long before all of this. The circumstance that we're now living in became a reality. And we're going to start a series, and the series is called Living Hope. And I guess for many of us, it's such such an important commodity. You know, uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope is a commodity that all of us need. We actually all need it both not only to to thrive in life, but actually to survive in life. It's been said that men and women can last 40 days without food. They can last three days without water and survive eight minutes without air. But actually, it's been said that we can't survive a moment without hope. Billy Graham, back in 1991, said perhaps the greatest psychological, spiritual, and medical need that all people have is the need for hope. And you know what hope is about? Hope contains all those wonderful qualities about trusting, it's about faith, it's about expectation, it's about future possibility. Hope is that reality that says that we we have something that we desire in our hearts. It gives us a future orientation. It paints a picture beyond where we are into something that currently isn't our future. And the Bible is full of experiences and expressions of hope from the start right through. The Bible encourages and invites you and I to hope. The Bible says that our faith is based on a hope of a different future. The Bible encourages you and me to to trust on and to lean on, to put our weight on uh, hope and, and the promises of God so that as we navigate and travel through life, then we have this hope for expectation of a future that is different from where we currently are. Hope, you see, is always future-orientated. Hope is that commodity that translates, I guess, the future into our present. And what do I mean by that? Well, actually, it takes that which we we expect, and that's what we look forward to, as almost generating the the fuel within us in how we live our todays. Hope is that which translates the future into our present. But hope is also the transport that takes us from where we are into a different future. It's the, the escort. It's the vehicle. Vehicle. It's the, as it were, the guide that takes you and I from where we currently are constantly on that journey, on that journey through difficulty, on that journey through pain, through anguish, through disappointment, on towards the future that we are looking forward to and to the realization of that future. I can remember every Every year, I guess, when I was, since I was a little child of just five, and, and when Christmas would, would come around, then all my, my hopes and, and expectations would be raised every Christmas. You see, I had a hope that one day I would be the proud owner of a Hornby train set. And as autumn time came, then hints would be dropped and expectations would rise, and, and I guess hope would begin to climb, hoping, as it were, that 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 future of having a Hornby train set all to myself would become a reality. But Christmas after Christmas, all my hopes were, were dashed every year. I know I, know I, have, I have actually recovered from it. I have actually been healed and whole, and I don't hold any grudges, and I am through all of that. But every year, my hopes would be disappointed because every year all I would end up with would be a jigsaw puzzle with a picture of a, 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 a railway track or, a, or a, 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 a railway engine. And so never were my hopes realized. That's not until I was a 47-year-old father. And maybe the children, because I'd spoken about my hopes so many times, maybe they felt sorry for me and took pity on me. And one Christmas, Under the tree was a wrapped up box, and as I opened the box, all my hopes were realized as a 47-year-old grown-up man as I received my Hornby train set. You see, the problem there was I had, all through my childhood, based my, my hope on the wrong thing. And so many of us are challenged to base our hope on the wrong thing. Sometimes we base our hope, as it were, on false possibilities, on the I hope so mentality. 
that we look ahead and we think, well, I hope so. I hope that's going to happen. I don't really know if it will, and, and I'm not sure if it will, but I hope that will happen. I see the prospects that it might happen, and we base our hope on the prospects that something might happen. You know, between the years of 1858 to 1862, 16,000 men descended on the Fraser Canyon in now British Columbia on the, the hope of a possibility that there might be gold in those hills. 16,000 descended on this little town of 500 and spent the next four years looking and searching and digging and, and, and blowing up, trying to find gold based upon the prospect on the possibility that there was. Of course, four years later, one or two people left with a few bars of gold, but for the majority, all their hopes were dashed because their hopes were based upon a false possibility. And all was left were dashed hopes, a small town called Hope, and 16,000 people left. But you see, that's what happens if you base your hope on a false possibility. Some people base their hope on flawed premises, the premise that I should hope so. If I'm going to do everything that I'm going to do, then I should hope so that some good things are going to turn out for me. If I, if I run 10,000 steps every day, if I eat all the vegetables under the sun, if I look after myself, then I should hope so that I'm going to live forever. But the reality is sometimes we all know people that have based their hopes on what they can do. And of course, hopes again are dashed. That's not what we're going to be talking about over these next few weeks. What we're going to be talking about over these next few weeks is that hope is based on firm promises. Not the promises that we have made, but the promises that God has made towards you and me. How do we live our lives and how do we look forward in our lives? Well, they should be based on the promises of God. The, the Bible is full of promises towards you and me that of what is ahead of us and what he's calling us to and what he's promised for us, not only in the life that we live at the moment, but in the life that is ahead of us. And the Bible is full of promises on which you and I base our hope. No, so no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the difficulties are, then you and I can have promises, ba uh, uh, hope based on firm promises of where we're going. And so today we want to start the series by talking about what is it that hope develops? What does our life look like that when we respond to that living hope of a God who keeps his promises for you and me, for me? What does our life look like when it's shaped by hope? And to do that, we want to kind of zero in on the experience of a, a, a first century church. It actually became the second church that was reached with the good news of the gospel as Paul was going on his second missionary journey. He took Silas and Dr. Luke from Philippi and his apprentice Timothy, and off they went on their second missionary journey, and they traveled into Europe. And the second city they came up to was a place of, of I guess, up in the north area of Gr now modern Greece. A, t a city of 200,000 people based with a fantastic commercial port with a main road running through it, with a, a, a great harbor that brought great commerce to the city, a city that was international, very much like Aberdeen, but a city that was called Thessalonica. And into that city came Paul and Silas and began preaching the gospel. The year is around 50, 51 AD, and it's just around 20 years after Jesus has risen from the grave. And as he's done that, they come and travel from the neighboring city of Philippi down into Thessalonica. And Paul begins, as it were, to, to preach hope to that community. And we're going to be looking at the letter from next week onwards. Paul has got many things to say in that letter. He's got several purposes that he wants to outwork as he writes the letter. He's got a personal purpose where he wants to say to them how much he loves them and how much he's excited by the report that Timothy brings and how much it is that they're being able to maintain the hope that is within them and how wonderful that is. He's saying to them, he's got an apostolic purpose that he wants to write the letter. He's the one who oversees, who planted the church, and as he's now writing back to them a year after he's visited, he wants to say to them, you know what? You're bringing my character into disrepute. You're, you're, you're bringing criticism uh, against me. And I want to tell you that I am motivated by hope, says Paul. I'm not vo motivated by personal gain. I'm motivated by a hope of a different future for all of you as you're living in Thessalonica. So he's got a personal purpose. He's got an apostolic pur pur purpose, but he's also got a doctrinal purpose. He wants to take time to tell them and to instruct them the meaning of hope, uh, the, the meaning of hope that exists for every believer as we look forward to Jesus Christ coming again, as we look forward to what eternal life will look like. And of course, Paul finishes off with a pastoral purpose, and he wants to remind them again that they need 
need to manifest this hope that is living within them. They need to live, as it were, in the light of the hope that they carry. They need to live a, a pure life, a holy life, a, a, that spiritual, as it were, hope they hold translates into the spiritual health that they have. And so we're gonna, I'm excited as we kick off the, the series in, for real next week, as we begin looking at the letter to this church in Thessalonica, as to how, how God has planted hope within the believers and what the outworking of that is as we go through the weeks ahead. But before we get into the letter, I wanted to take some time today just to unpack the start of this church. It's written in Acts chapter 17, and it tells us the story of when Paul initially went to Thessalonica and what the impact of the hope that was within Paul was able to not only develop him, but it developed those that are around him. So if you've got a Bible, then let's turn to Acts chapter 17. If you don't, then the words will be on the screen. And we're going to read just a few verses together that tell us of this first collision of the hope that was within Paul and the people in Thessalonica. This is what it says. It says, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on, and on three Sundays he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. As did a large uh, uh, Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, and so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they put Jason and the others on bail, and they let them go. You know, today I want to just look at three simple observations to encourage us about seeing the difference that placing our hope on the promises of God will make, seeing how the, the things will develop in our lives because we place our hope on the promises of God. Number one, that hope develops our purpose in life. You know, sometimes it's not difficult to lose sight of why we, what, we, why, why, what life is all about and why we're here. Particularly in these days, one day just slips into the next, one week slips into the next. It's very difficult, isn't it? Apart from visiting the fridge or perhaps going upstairs or maybe downstairs or maybe around the block where your home is, every day just slips into the next. So easy to lose sight of why are we here? You know, I love being a natural introvert. I love just my little cave, which is upstairs in, in a little office that I have. And for years, that has been my cave that I can disappear to and just find my own place. But now with everything being online and everything being a Zoom call, I've got all these Zoomers that are now invading my cave and I don't even have space in my cave. And I think, what is all this for? It's so easy to lose our purpose. Sometimes, actually, there are larger things that happen in our lives that really uh, cause our lives to... to uh, uh, wobble and we think, why am I doing what I'm doing and where am I going and what is my life? Well, I want to remind you again today and to encourage you again today that it's hope that develops a purpose in our life. It's hope that, that generates again what our life is about and where we're going and what is the future about. If you and I again could grasp, for, 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 if we could grasp that sense of hope that is within us, both not only for this life, but for the life that is ahead, and the hope that we can generate and give to other people, then how marvelous that would be to get us up with a spring in our step in the morning and get us going. Sometimes it's easy to let our get up and go actually get up and go. And for us to, to be reminded that, that it's God that's promised that whoever calls upon His name will be saved. That it's God who's promised that whoever believes in Him will have everlasting life. That it's God who's promised that He will never leave us or forsake us. If you and I could get a handle on that, then our purpose would be clear. You see, we, we, our purpose develops through hope. Our purpose is developed through the hope that is within us. And that hope is obtained through the promises of God. 
How has hope developed purpose in Paul's life? You know, years after he'd had a radical experience on a, on a, a road towards a small town called Damascus, Years later, he's recounting and retelling that story to a king as he's telling, this is the purpose for my life, and this is why I'm going. And in Acts 26, he says these words, now it's because of my hope in what God has promised that I am on trial today. He realized that it was because of the promises of God that actually was the purpose and why he was living his life. He'd obtained the hope through the promises of God. He goes on and says that in that moment of encounter, God had said, Paul, I'm going to take you and I'm going to use you and you're going to be the one who's going to reach the, the, the Gentiles, those who are non-Jews, with this wonderful gospel, with this great hope. And that's going to be the purpose of your life. I'm going to fill you with hope that lives will be changed, that towns will be transformed, that people will never be the same again, all because of the hope that I have and the promises that I'm willing to give. Hope, you see, is, is obtained by the promises of God. But hope for Paul was retained through the practice of his daily life. Sometimes our hope is, can be like a roller coaster. One day it's fantastic and it's up and we're full of hope and the next day our hopes are dashed. Isn't it great in verse 2 that Paul says, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue. Paul had learned, you see, that hope is retained as we do the things that we are normally supposed to do day by day by day. He'd established some patterns and routines into his life that cultivated and grew and developed hope within him. Hope that would sustain him. Hope, hope that would keep him going. Hope in a future of transformed lives. Hope in a future that the gospel would make a difference. Hope that, 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 that peace would be the, his portion even in the midst of his difficulties. And that he established through doing the things that he normally did. Sometimes we overest, underestimate the power of just doing the same things. It says that on three Sabbaths, he went to church. He met with the people that were there. He worshiped together. He lifted his hands. He read the Bible. He prayed. Simple things that you and I need to, in this time of lockdown, in this time of, of turmoil, we need to begin retaining hope through the daily practices of our life. Whatever that is for you, whether it's reading or praying or inviting somebody or sharing or serving or helping or supporting or giving or telling or showing, whatever it is that you put in as daily patterns and practices in your life, keep on doing them. Can I encourage you? Keep on reading the Word. Keep on praying. Keep on inviting people into your watch parties. Keep on sharing with people online what the, your church is doing. Keep on telling your story of what God is doing. See, sometimes our hope that we endeavor to retain by doing the normal th things is not about the instant. It's not about the moment. It's not about the magical. It's actually more about the constant. It's more about the commitment, and it's more about the methodical. It's that which we do on a regular basis. Paul's hope for a purpose in his life was obtained through the promises of God. It was retained through the practice of life, but it was sustained by perseverance. Keeping on, keeping on. Romans 5 and verse 3 to 5 reminds us that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And Paul says that hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in the hearts of, by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Paul tells Timothy also that he says, this is why we labor and strive, because we've put our hope in the living God. You know, it's hope that sustains you and I through the difficulties. I'm sure that there are many listening to the sound of my voice today and watching this online church uh, that we're, we're holding today and are in that place of, I don't know what I can hold on to anymore. Where are the anchors of my life? Where are the normal things? Then today, can I encourage you that hope in a God who never changes is the where, where our, our, our anchor should be. Hope in a God who keeps his promises is where we sustain our life and keep persevering and keep on going on. Paul, you see, was on purpose to fulfill that which God had called him to do. In the midst of all the setbacks and the trials and the difficulties, Paul continued fulfilling the promise, the purpose that God had for him right up until the day he died. I think it is no surprise, and we'll probably hear it next week when we look at, at the first bit of the letter in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. It says that Paul says, I remember you before our God and Father because of your work produced by faith, because of your labor prompted by love, and because of your endurance, your perseverance inspired by hope. 
Oh, that if you're today thinking, what is the purpose of my life? Then let, let hope develop the purpose of your life. Let hope in a God who's for you, not against you, help to develop where you're going and what he's calling you to do. God has got a great purpose for every one of our lives, and it's fueled and it's shaped and it's mobilized by a hope in the one who never changes and who's always the same. Hope develops the purpose in our life, but it's also hope that develops the passion in our life. Life is a way of knocking the stuffing out of all of us. There are things that come and collide with our life that, that can often remove all the passion and all the zeal and all the joy and all the peace that we have in our lives. In this story, we see that Paul has arrived from Philippi into Thessalonica. And the Bible gives a story of, of what happened while he was in Philippi. It says that he was severely flogged in that city. It says he was thrown in a dark dungeon. It said he was humiliated as a Roman citizen. I think for many of us, just one of those things would have caused our hope to disappear, would have caused our hope to evaporate. You know, he writes himself in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, he says, how badly we've been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet God gave us the courage to declare his good news, to speak to you boldly in spite of great opposition. You know, once Paul gets out of Philippi, he's got a three-day, three to four-day, 100-mile journey to take. I, I don't know for about you, as, as you and I travel through the difficulties of life, it's so easy for our passion to disappear. What keeps somebody going? What keeps somebody motivated? What keeps somebody on that journey towards their purpose in the midst of hurt and pain and insults and opposition and difficulty? I know that there are so many of us who once ran the race and once started and, and stepped out in, on, uh, with great purpose, full of hope in what God was going to do and th in and through them, full of hope for what the different future was going to be, putting their trust in God and putting their anchors down in a God who never changed. And somewhere along the line, something happened. Challenges overtook. Uh, problems arose. And hope and passion disappeared. You know, there's a fantastic story told of a guy called Vice Admiral, uh, his first name was James Bond Stockdale. And he was uh, a U.S. aircraft pilot. And he was captured in the Vietnam War, and he suffered seven years in horrendous conditions in a Vietnamese prison. It was called the Hanoi Hilton. And he was there for, for seven years, and in that time he lost his hearing because he was beat up. He couldn't barely walk because his legs had been broken on two occasions. He emerged out of that prison seven years later, and, and many years later he was asked, how did you manage to survive? How did you, were you the one who managed? And he said, I managed to survive because of the hope that I carried within my life. And then the interviewer said, well, how come others didn't survive? How come others uh, didn't manage? And he said, well, it was easy to know why they didn't manage. The ones who didn't manage were the optimists. The ones who thought that everything was just going to be okay. That you just needed to speak some good words. That, that as we looked forward with, with a, a positive expectation that everything was going to be okay. He said that the ones who didn't make it, where they were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas. And Christmas came and went. We're going to be out by Easter. And Easter came and went. He, and he said that for him it was different. He said, you, you must never confuse hope that you will prevail in the end which you can never afford to lose. But also you must hold to the discipline to confront the most brutal facts and the current reality, whatever they may be. You know, we're facing difficult times at the moment. And it may well be that you know somebody yourself personally who's either in the midst of the difficulty physically with battling coronavirus, or perhaps you know somebody whose family have been bereaved or, or lost. All of our economy has gone topsy-turvy. It may be that you are in the place of furlough or even have lost your job. And it may well be that your lockdown is finding you difficult in, in the mental health challenges that we all have of what's going to happen and what is the future. And it's so easy for passion and zeal for life to dissipate and disappear. Can I encourage you today? Can I remind you again, again today? It's important that we acknowledge this is the reality in which we're in at the moment. But as we acknowledge the reality that we're in, we must never lose sight of the fact that our hope is in God. 
that He is the one who holds our future. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who knows everything that's going on around us, and our passion can be fueled and, and put aflame again because we put our trust in Him, because we put our, prom- our hope in His promises, that He is a God who never fails. I love the fact that Paul's pain of just surviving in in Philippi was less than his passion of arriving at Thessalonica. His purpose and the plans and the promises that God had given him fueled his hope so much that his passion continued to rise despite all the difficulties, despite the sufferings and the challenges that he'd encountered. Because his passion had been developed by hope, and that hope had spurred him on to boldness and to courage. 2 Corinthians 3 says these words in verse 12, as Paul looks on the the eternal life that's ahead of him, he said, with that kind of hope to excite us, nothing holds us back. Have you got that kind of hope within you that is exciting you so much to say, nothing's going to hold me back because I know in whom I have believed and I'm, uh, and, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep me and, and to, to look after me every day of my life as I pursue the purpose that he has for us. Hope develops our purpose in life, and hope is the thing that that fuels and develops our passion in life. And as we close uh, as our time together today, hope is also the thing that develops our perspective in life. 1 Peter 1, 3, we read it earlier. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, when you and I allow the living hope based on the promises of God to develop the purpose and the passion of our lives, then you and I have a brand new perspective of how do we live our lives. What does it take? Well, you know, it needs us to be receptive to hope. When we read the story in Acts chapter 17, it tells us how there were men and women there who were, were religious people, Jews who were faithful and regular in their attendance in the, in the local setting or the local community of the synagogue. Just like people who are, who've brought, been brought up with a faith and with an understanding of what it means to trust God and are part of our community. Some of them were, were receptive to the hope that they had of. It says that others who had no background but were, were searching for God, were searching for hope, they also were receptive to the hope that was given. And then it talks about some well-off women, some prominent women, ones that perhaps you wouldn't expect, ones that perhaps were just listening in, ones that were perhaps just exploring what all this was about. Well, they also were receptive to hope. Paul was presenting a good news of a gospel of a Jesus who died, who loved each one, who died for each one, who gave his life for each one, and paid the price for each one, who took the sin of each one, and then rose from the dead victorious, and was ever living for each one of us. And Paul presented that hope, that we have a hope eternal in in the God who is able to take care of every issue in our lives. And as Paul presented that, then they were receptive to hope. And if our perspective of life has to change, it starts with having a fresh receptivity to hope that is presented to us. But not only were they receptive to hope, they were responsive to hope. I, I guess if, if, we, if you remember the story we just read, I wonder if you can imagine the, or picture the scene. They've, uh, the, we're in Jason's house. And Jason, with a few other of his friends there, probably some of the others that are mentioned in Acts, a guy called Aristarchus, another one called Gaius, another one called Secundus, perhaps they were all there, and they were just sharing some Greek salad and maybe some souvlaki, and they shared all the meal, and then they said farewell to Paul and Silas, and Paul and Silas left. And just at the same time, all of a sudden, there are, there's a, a rabble outside the door, and because a mob had been gathered, and they wanted to find Paul and Silas. And they wanted to understand what is going on here. They are turning the world upside down. And they burst through the door, and there they find Jason and all the friends. And the Bible says that they dragged Jason and all the friends outside because they couldn't find Paul and Silas. You know, it's okay for us to be receptive to the hope that we know. But how do we respond to the reality of the hope that is within us? I guess in that moment, Jason had to decide, and all of them had to decide, what does following Jesus really mean? What does it really mean that hope is within me? What difference does that make when everything around me is coming down, when the world is all against me, when challenges are around me? What difference does it make? How am I going to respond? And because their perspective had been totally transformed and changed, it says that they were part of and and jumped right into the deep end. I love that. I love that no longer were they on the edges, no longer were they in the fringe. They said they jumped right in at the deep end 
and were there right in the middle. They, their response was, you know, we have found this hope of not only for today, not only for our lives, but also for our future and for our eternity. And so we're going to stand uh, with, with that sense of passion, with that sense of purpose, and we're going to represent this hope that we have in God. You see, they'd got that new perspective from hope. You see, they've done more than be receptive and responsive to the message of hope. This message actually produced a brand new way to see the rest of their lives. This hope had shifted the way they perceived how their lives were going to be. The perspective of their life was no longer going to be just about themselves. The perspective of their life was no longer about just holding on to this hope. The perspective of their life was now so much larger. They've been brought into this reality that God wants every one of us to be the kind of people that turn the world upside down. I'm not talking about rebellious living. I'm not talking about riotous stuff. I'm talking about bringing that radical hope in a God who ever lives into your life, into my life. And how's that going to infect and affect those that are around us? It made for Jason and those that were there a brand new perspective in life. And as we go through this series, we're going to see how hope has transformed this whole community in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of lockdown, in the midst of challenges. Yet hope was alive to bring fresh purpose to the people who were living in Thessalonica, to keep their passion alive in the midst of difficulty, and to give them fresh perspective. You know, today, as we are closing up this time together, as we've praised together and we've prayed together and we've seen what God has done in through the, our lives this last week, then maybe it's today that God wants to give you a fresh perspective for the life that is ahead of you. Maybe as you're in this lockdown moment, maybe this has been the time that God has been speaking to you and challenging you. What is your life all about? Why is the zeal and the joy and the peace and the happiness and the passion for life all disappeared? What is it that you see about life around you? Then God wants to invite you today, invite you today to receive that hope from the promises that he has made. He said that if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. He said he'll respond to everyone who calls on his name. He said he's there for each one of us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He is the one who said he'll be there in the midst of the storm. He is our shepherd who is there to take us and lead us and guide us through life. That's our God who keeps his promises. And today he's inviting each one of us to respond. Respond to the hope that he can give. Respond to the hope that he makes available for us. Respond to the hope that is not only for today, but it's for our every days. And it's for every day, not only in this life, but it's for every day in eternity. Maybe that's you I'm talking to today. Maybe it's you that needs to turn your life around and invite God to bring fresh hope into your life. It's so easy. All we do is say, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. I recognize I've been trying to live my life on a set of false promises, on a set of, of false possibilities, on a set of flawed premises, but I want to put my, my, my trust in the firm promises that you gave, that you will never cast anyone away, that the death that Jesus died on Calvary is for everyone. And so maybe today, can I lead you in a prayer of invitation, a prayer of invitation that, that invites the Lord Jesus into your heart, to bring you fresh hope, to live life, to live it with purpose, to live it with full of passion, and to bring you a fresh perspective. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Lord, you're right here in this moment. We thank you, God, that you are the one who gives us hope as an anchor that keeps us steadfast and sure through every storm and trial of life. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one who gives us this living hope, Lord, because Jesus died for us, because he gave his life for us, but because he rose again from the dead. And Father, we thank you that you, you invite us today to invite you in, Lord, and to invite you not only to come and take away all our sin and the, the, the sadness and the difficulties and the anguish of our past, but also to give us hope and fresh hope for living life and living life in all its fullness today and every day. And so, Father, for everyone who's praying today, Lord, everyone who's calling on your name, you've promised that you will bring salvation. Father, for everyone that's inviting you into their life today, God, that you would open their eyes to see a fresh perspective, that you would give them that clarity of the fresh purpose of your life, and you would place within them, as it were, rivers of living water, Lord, and live, to bring that passion for life alive again. 
Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer today, we'd love to hear from you. Please text the number that you've seen throughout the, the service today. Don't disappear. Stay online. We're going to have a quick chat and a conversation together on Instagram, and you'll find us. Just go to King's Community Church Instagram, and you'll find us there, and we'll want to have a, a conversation with you. We'd love to help you to take that next step to bring that hope alive and to allow hope to develop in your life. Have a fantastic week. We look forward to seeing you. It's going to be a great series as we look at living hope in our lives. Bless you.